Hi, it's a beautiful fall day here in central Vermont and uh, the leaves are drifting down to the forest floor. I'm so excited to be out in the woods with all of you. We're going into Little River State Park. We're up in the History Hike area. We're going to bracket this walk with an, a small homestead farm and then a larger uh, farm that stayed, the, the Ricker farm that stayed in the family for multiple generations. And just kind of look at the patterns of settlement on these hillsides. And the reason for this partly is that if you want to understand 21st century forests in Vermont, you need to understand 18th century farming practices and the patterns that those have left in our landscapes. So we'll be going out on the um, Little River State Park History hike. Come when they're open and enjoy this walk because there's a lot of things to be seen out on this landscape. Uh, we're going to bracket the whole history hike. We're not doing the whole loop today. We're going to start at the David Hill farm and then we're going to cut around to the Gideon Ricker farm because these two farms can tell a pretty complete story of what was going on up in this landscape, mostly from the early 1800s until the early 1900s. So this is the, the David Hill farm homestead and David Hill made a lot of his income from running a sawmill. So we'll find that the farming practices here are um, at a much smaller scale. And we'll look around and look for evidence of what has happened on this site. He was really only here from 1837 to, to 1845, so not even 10 years. But that seemed to be the nature of this homestead, that it changed hands a lot through time. So one of the first things that I often notice that alerts me to the fact that I might be near an old homestead are plants that are out of place in the forested landscape. So here we have some daylilies growing right here on this bank. And these have been here, you know, reproducing vegetatively, uh, spreading slightly, maybe not loving this environment, but they have been here for over 150 years. So, and let's walk in and see a few of the other things we might find. Two other plants that are often relics of uh, human settlement, European settlement, are apple trees. And this one's gotten really leggy and tall, and we have found one or two apples from this tree recently, so it is still bearing fruit. They're small. Uh, these wild apples tend to be bitter. They were used mostly for hard cider. So they weren't the kind of apples that we go to the grocery store and buy and take a luscious bite out of. Um, when they weren't used for cider, they were often chosen for their properties that allowed them to be stored through the winter. So they were kind of hard and they'd get a little sweeter over time. And sometimes they were fed to livestock. So really different apple varieties than we see today in our supermarkets. These heirloom apple varieties are actually gaining popularity again because of the resurgence in the hard cider apple cider market. So people are going out now and looking for these old trees in the woods so that they can get some of these heritage apples to have them grow again into apple trees. Another plant that you often find around foundations are lilacs. And here's just the tiniest remnant of what probably was a big lilac bush that was planted here just to help decorate this dooryard of this family home. So other things that we see around old homesteads are nut trees. And this is a butternut tree and it was standing when I first started coming out to this site maybe 15 years ago. And it had bark on it for many years. Now it'd be pretty hard for me to identify. But when you find a big old nut tree in the woods, you may be near a homestead. Another pattern that we're seeing on this site, and you will see it on other sites as well, are these wide um, lower branches coming off of this beech tree. So these open grown trees that clearly grew up in the sunlight. They're, when they get much bigger, they're often referred to as wolf trees. But this American beech grew up without competition. And the other thing I notice right next to it is this cut stump. So evidence of the logging that occurred to open up this land for livestock and crops. The last and perhaps most iconic feature in, an, in, a, in a homestead uh, settlement site is a cellar hole. And I'm standing down in the root cellar of this, what used to be a house. Uh, the, the whole foundation is 
as Robert Frost says in his poem Directive, closing in like a dent in dough. Uh, over time, these become less and less visible. This was a fairly small house. I, I paced it off and it looks like it was about 20 by 12. And it was a wooden structure that stood above this stone foundation. We have records that show that a house this size would have needed about 40 cords of wood to, make, to heat it through the winter. So these were small, drafty homesteads that people were living in while they worked this land. So one interesting pattern we see at the, in the back of the lot of uh, the David Hill Farm are these two parallel rows of paper birches. And if we look at our feet, we can see the topography is rutted. And we're standing on an old road that used to run from the David Hill Farm up to the Gideon Ricker Farm, where we're headed next. The wagon wheels created bare mineral soil. The birch tend to throw lots of seed out into the wind and they land everywhere, but they germinate where there's bare mineral soil because they're so small, they don't have enough root energy to get down through the duff on the forest floor. These big old paper birches that became established here probably a little over a hundred years ago um, when the, these farms were abandoned are reaching, are starting to age out. They're reaching their, their lifespan and you're starting to see pieces of them scattered on the forest floor. And in another hundred years, all evidence of them will be gone. We've reached the Ricker farm and I want to point out one pattern immediately. This stone wall with the small rocks in it is a definite indication that this land was plowed. And some of the things that we know they were growing were India wheat, potatoes, peas, um, and things like that that, that uh, were plowed. If the crop was the potatoes, I often see really little stones in the walls. Like if we could actually trace a piece of land to the crop that was grown there through agricultural records, everything potato size and and larger would be put into the stone wall. And so here we're seeing some of the smaller rocks. The other thing I notice in this landscape is this dip that I'm standing in, which gives way to a berm. This berm is called a dead uh, furrow. So every year when they plowed this field, they couldn't get any closer to the stone wall. So the dirt was evened out across the rest of the landscape, but it piled up right here next to the stone wall. So I wanted to start out by saying a, a, a real deep gratitude and thank you to Jane Dorney, who's a cultural geographer, who really helped me understand this farm site. We're at the Gideon Ricker Farm here in Little River State Park. And I'm delighted to be talking to you about this landscape. I'd also like to start by saying there's some patterns to how this hillside and actually other hillsides in Vermont were settled. And um, people from southern New England largely, although this actual Gideon family came from Maine, um, were purchasing properties sight unseen. And so they looked at the surveying maps and they looked at the land and they tried to make some decisions about what would be a good farm situation for them. One of the things they looked for were south facing slopes. So they definitely wanted the warmer winters. So we tended to find these southern facing slopes being settled earliest. Then they would look for farms that were about 1,800 to 1,600 feet because they wanted to get out of the cold, uh, frosty spring days in the valley where the cold air drains down. They wanted to have the more temperate climate of these hillsides. And they also looked for what was growing on them. And the preference was for forests that, were, that had sugar maple and American beech in them because those tended to be indicators of, of good soils and warmer weather. So here we are standing in the Gideon Ricker uh, cellar hole. So this house was built in two stages. The, the smaller part was built in the 1830s and then it was added on to in the 1860s when Gideon Sr. and one of his sons, also named Gideon, decided to combine 
uh, their resources and their families. So they lived in this house um, at that time. I see over here between the stones, there's a little bit of mortar um, between the rocks. So mortar tells us immediately that this was a house foundation and not a barn foundation. People did use to t tend to use mortar for barns. So we've crossed the road from the Rickard house and we're now in the larger of the two barns that are on this side of the property. The barns were built away from the houses, partly for sanitation reasons, just the flies and the smell of the manure, but mainly because of fire. People didn't want the fire to spread from the house to the barn or from the barn to the houses and lose everything in one fire. And since uh, the light, the houses were lit with candles and kerosene lamps, it was a real danger. It was built in stages. You can see some walls over here to my right that were earlier parts of this barn. But eventually it grew to 120 feet long. They had 17 cows and 17 heifers. They were milking them by hand twice a day, so that was a big enough operation then to keep people busy. This barn was designed as a bank barn. It was built into the hillside. It was a later form of barn construction than the early English barns. This was when they, again, had started to accumulate some wealth. Uh, it was built in three stories. They stored the hay on the top, uh, they'd shovel, they'd rake it down, pitch it down to the cows who would eat it, and then the manure would go down to the bottom floor where it would be mucked out into the dooryard. So another feature that you find in Vermont woods sometimes, and certainly in uh, Vermont towns and landscapes, are cemeteries. And here we are at the Ricker Family Cemetery. It was common at the time to plant white cedar around the periphery. It comes from the biblical cedars of Lebanon, and these of course are not related to them, but to have the tree of life as they thought of it around the cemetery was auspicious. It was, good. It was a good thing to do. And we'll look inside the headstones in a minute, but you'll see that the people were buried with their feet pointing to the east, and the thought was when these cemeteries were being created, it was during the Great Awakening, you know, those people did sit up um, into a second life that they'd be facing the rising sun. So there are interesting customs from that time. When the Rickers created the cemetery, I bet they thought they'd be here forever. You know, you can't see into the future. They thought they were investing in a farm that would last and last and last. And, what they didn't see uh, was the Civil War coming. They didn't see the railroad uh, expanding markets and taking people out west. Um, and ultimately, they didn't see the dam that, that actually drowned the center of their town, Little Moscow, which was kind of the very last piece of the story. That dam went in after a giant flood in 1927. And in that flood, there were eight inches of rain over a two-day period in November. Montpelier's business district was under eight to 10 feet of water. The Richmond Bridge washed out. 55 people died in the Winooski River Valley. And so the need to control the hydrology of the Winooski River became paramount in people's minds. And, and that's when the dam was constructed. And, and it took a few years for it to happen but it was built from the mid to late 1930s. We're here at our last stop on the hike through um, this Ricker Basin today, uh, and we're stopping at a sugar house. Uh, we'll look at the evidence that's left behind, um, but, but the way this location has been interpreted is the sugar bush was an important part of most Vermont farms. The traditional time to start sugaring was just after town meeting day, the first Tuesday in March. Herb Pike, the great-grandson of Gideon Ricker Sr., developed a large sugar bush here after he purchased the farm in 1910. So if you're hiking in your own woods, you may find, or, or in woods elsewhere in Vermont, you may find maple uh, sugaring buckets, usually old metal buckets, but sometimes you find the actual house, the sugar shack, and that's what we found here today. And they're the bricks and the 
things that created the uh, archway for the fire to boil off the sap. Sometimes if you poke around you'll find a layer of ash or some charcoal from the fire. We're not going to do that on this site because um, this is these artifacts are really for the for all the public to see and we don't want to be disturbing them. Um, but but do you know look around yourself near where you live and see what you're able to find. Um, sugaring, making sugar and earlier often making cream or candy which was easier to store you know or just taking it down to sugar instead of syrup and we learned these traditional skills from the Abenaki and other people that, we, that um, European settlers came in contact with and the tradition is really carried through to today. It's still something that's iconically Vermont. This feels like a good time to pause and acknowledge that we are walking over the unceded land of the Abenaki. This le land was never deeded over by the Abenaki people to the settlers who've lived on this landscape and are now gone as well. So we're in a park, but we are still on um, native land. And I just wanted to say as we stand here over this maple sh sugar shack that um, one of my favorite uh, authors on this topic of Abenaki relationships and, and other Native American relationships to the land is Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book Braiding Sweetgrass and she talks about making uh, maple syrup with her children and uh, I just like the way that she ends this, this part of the story. One half of the truth is that the earth endows us with great gifts. The other half is that the gift is not enough. The responsibility does not lie with the maples alone. The other half belongs to us. We participate in its transformation. It is our work and our gratitude that distills the sweetness. It's just a, a really excellent resource for thinking about the relationship to the land that other cultures have had and still have here in Vermont. So we've entered now one of my favorite places on Ricker Mountain. We're in the sugar bush uh, for the Gideon Ricker farm. But really what we're in is a, a very old forest. You can see the soils have developed here for a very long time. And the first thing that catches my eye is this pit and mound topography where you can see where trees have been thrown up and have decayed in place and have created a very uneven and beautiful landscape unlike the ones that were tamed and plowed that we walked through before we arrived here. Thank you for joining us on this hike on a beautiful fall day to look at the evidence of farming on this hillside of Ricker Mountain. Um, come to Little River State Park whenever they open again um, and you will see this evidence throughout this history hike, but also go look in your own woods. There were farms everywhere in Vermont in the 1800s, and you will find stone walls, cellar holes, look for, watch for the wells, you don't want to fall into the wells, um, and enjoy, you know, looking at the, the history that's written into your forests. Um, I have one more place I want to take you. I want to also welcome you back to more adventures that we'll be having. Uh, in this series of nature hikes. But for now, let's go look at my favorite place on Ricker Mountain. The other thing I love about this old sugar bush are the giant trees. There are just majestic sugar maples out here, but also large yellow birches, white ashes, paper birches. It's such a gorgeous forest. And it makes me think a lot about how vision can become reality. The people who came here in the late 1700s, early 1800s, had a vision of a pastoral landscape. And we discovered that with a lot of hard work, they can turn a forest into a pasture. Um, and I think it's time to rebalance that. I actually have a vision that more of us in Vermont could grow up among old trees. So I'm going to leave an offering, both as gratitude to the sugar maple for the maple syrup gratitude to the Abenaki for the wisdom they taught us to make it. And also, again, this prayer that more maples can grow old, more ashes, more birches, more trees, more forests can become old forests in Vermont.